All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Automation and Light Control in the Greenhouse, powered by Greenhouse Management. I'm Matt McClellan, the Managing Editor of Nursery Management Magazine, and I'm glad you could join us today. Automation for lighting control in greenhouses is key to regulating the photo period to control flowering or to increase growth to increase crop quality and yield. Light is an essential element, and it's not always available in its natural form to address our needs. During today's webinar, sponsored by Argus Controls, you will learn from our panel of experts about the technologies available and how to use them to maximize natural and artificial light in your facility to achieve better results. Now, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. This webinar is being recorded and will be available in five to seven days on our website. That's greenhousemag.com. If you have questions for our speakers, you can ask them anytime by using the Q&A function in your Zoom taskbar. The views expressed during this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily Greenhouse Management Magazine or GIE Media. This virtual conference does not constitute an endorsement of the vendor or the speaker's views, products, or services. Now, I am pleased to introduce today's speakers, Jeff Neff and Eric Cheek. Jeff started his career at Argus Controls in 1994 as a senior application technician, where he helped Argus customers with systems design and integration, climate controls, irrigation, fertigation, lighting, CO2, and custom process control applications. In October of 2020, Jeff became the application services technical lead at Argus to provide technical leadership to all application service technicians and offer training services to Argus employees and channel partners. Eric worked at Syngenta Biotechnology in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina for 18 years as a greenhouse maintenance technician and Argus controls technician. While at Syngenta, he was responsible for maintaining the operations of the greenhouse equipment, as well as the Argus control system. As the lead Argus technician on site, Eric was directly involved in implementing the various types of programs used to control temperature, humidity, CO2 injection, soil moisture percentage irrigation, and HID light levels, as well as light accumulation using DLI to optimize performance. Welcome, Eric and Jeff. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, and with that, uh, the first uh, talking point we wanted to discuss are key elements that affect light in the greenhouse. Eric or uh, Jeff, would one of you want to discuss maybe how structure, I believe, is one of the, the key elements. Uh, can we go over um, how that could impact light in the greenhouse? Well, the structure itself, and that, and it's often you know something we don't we don't think about in in a, in a greenhouse uh, is we have we have the outdoor light coming in, we have the the structure itself, we have the uh, the physical equipment that is you know we have light coming in, we have beams and various things that are that are preventing light from getting to the crop level. So structure would be one uh, sort of the first thing we would look at in terms of what is impacting the light in the greenhouse as well as we think about structure outside that structure, other buildings. So there could be a, a large tank or another adjacent building, all those impact the light that goes into environment. And, and where that in, uh, sort of greenhouse zone is situated on the whole property, is it on the east or west side? You know, because as the sun comes up, you know, uh, at dawn, it's going to hit the first greenhouses, and then as it moves across the horizon, it, you know it's going to hit the the other side. So that's going to impact the the actual light that's in at the crop level. So I'm talking about the uh, you know what's outside coming in, and in the physical structure itself. Okay. Um, what are some of the are there other key elements that affect light in the greenhouse, uh, Eric? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, like the glazing material, um, how much light uh, is transmitted through the, uh, if it's a glass ceiling or whatever, whatever your structure is made of, the, um, what kind of equipment may be hanging in the ceiling. You may have unit heaters and stuff like that, or bay fixtures that may actually block some of the light as well. Um, uh, 
but I think that one of the big things is just the glazing material. What you, what is the light passing through, and how much is actually getting through to the plant level? There are uh, different types of glazing material uh, that that can be used. Um, the, there's some polycarbonate type uh, material, glass. Um, depending on what kind of greenhouse you have, you know, the, the, I was at, at a research facility, so ours was glass. Um, but you could have, you know, polycarbonate, like I said, uh, other, there's several other kinds of uh, material. I'm not sure of all of them though, but it's just, it, uh, I think the most common one is gonna be glass, I would think. One of the things that comes up with the glazing material is, is is how well it even diffuses that light as it comes in, because you know the biggest thing in, in, in a, like a like a, a, a glass that is completely clear, it comes in and you're going to get shadows from equipment, whereas there's other glazing materials that actually have been uh, treated. Maybe Eric, you can comment in terms of that type of uh, type of glazing material. But the idea is is it ref refracts all the uh, 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 light and, and eliminates the, the shadows. Um, what are some of the, uh, the equipment that can be used, uh, to impact light in, in the, the greenhouse? We talked a little bit about the, the structure and the glazing, but, um, what are some other things that, that might be, need to be considered? Well, as we get, uh, you know, we talked about the the equipment, the the various things that that prevent light from getting in. Now we're talking, you know, uh, in terms of the uh, type of lighting equipment itself, right? And uh, you know, we're talking about HID, LED, um, you know, high pressure soda, metal halide, um, you know, the various light sources. Uh, that would be the what's putting in light in the environment. And keep in mind that that in an environment where there is a lot of light fixtures, they are in fact are uh, blocking light as well. So, uh, you know, an environment where you want to get a, a lot of artificial lighting, they're going to have their own reflective lenses that's going to actually prevent light from the, from the sun coming in. So that's something that has to be considered as well. Um, the other thing to, to, to consider, and this is not in all facilities, it's primarily in research facilities, is you often have a uh, lighting uh, that are mounted on a, uh, a on a apparatus that allows you to uh, increase or decrease its elevation, so you can lower or, uh, or raise those those actual lamps. Um, I'm not entirely sure how often that would be in commercial operations, but it, it definitely gives you that flexibility of of positioning those lamps, um, you know, either closer or further away from the crop. Okay. Um, are some of what are some of the uh, with those HID and LED types? Um, what are some of the? Is there anything involved with dimming capabilities? Is that something that that greenhouses can do? It's uh, dimming is becoming more and more of a, a you know you know with LED lights, some HID lights are becoming dimmable. Uh, it's, it's definitely gives you that flexibility of, of, you know, dialing back the light, say in the summertime, or, or the opposite, obviously, in the wintertime, you want to make up on those on those dark, darker uh, parts of the year. Uh, in the Argus system, you know, we can put some control in there in terms of dimming those lights to a specific set point to so to maintain a you know at crop light uh, setting, um, or we simply do a more of a seasonal change where we say uh, you know either weekly, monthly, um, that we change the the intensity of those lights. Okay, and so that's something that the the grower can adjust when using automation, set it so that it will um, happen either um, through seasonal seasonality or uh, maybe even on a crop by crop basis, depending on uh, how the system's set up? Correct, yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, seasonal, uh, it could be daily. Um, 
you know, on terms of the dimming. Um, but it, it is something that's new in terms of the industry. I'd say new is in the last couple of years um, in terms of, so I think a big part of the dimming is just trying to figure out the best way to use that technology, right? Because really in most cases, you know, with, with the plants, the only time I've seen it, you know, where we want to dim it is where we want to simulate that, that morning and that afternoon that to simulate natural sun, you know, something in a different time of the year, for example, I want to simulate summer in the winter time. So I might use that dimming light to, to create that nice curve. But from other than that, generally we like to keep them just fixed on, you know, at, at a particular point or some particular preset point based on a set point schedule or the daily, weekly, or monthly. Okay, okay. Um, we got a question in on the topic, since we're talking a little bit about artificial light, maybe now would be a good time to, to tackle it. Uh, the question was, is diffused light or artificial light best suited in a greenhouse? Eric or uh, Jeff would like to, to take a crack at that one. Diffused uh, light or artificial light. Um, I mean, in a greenhouse, you know, you're, you're, you, you want to take advantage as much as you can of outdoor light or, uh, in terms of that, yeah, if you can. Okay. Okay, so it's sort of that in, in the situation where uh, the artificial light can, can help with uh, uh, when you don't quite have the amount of natural light you might want or the type of light that you need for a particular crop then. Yeah, it, it's, it's other, you're, you're other trying to apply a, uh, a, like a photo period sort of treatment, so to speak. So you wanna maintain a photo period. That's what, you know, it, it, that's what the lights are bringing to you. So you could, you could you know, provide a X many hours of days where that time of year, you may not be able to get that from the, from the natural light source um, or just simply uh, supplementing to bring up the, that minimum light level that you're, that's in your environment. Okay, okay. All right. Um, how about uh, types of shade equipment? What are some of the ways that you can, you know, provide shade when you need it in a greenhouse? Uh, what are some of the options available for greenhouses? Well, there's in shade cloths and oh, go ahead, Jeff. No, go ahead, Eric. I was just gonna say that the you can install shade cloths or shade curtains to where if you're if you want to reduce the outdoor uh, the natural sunlight coming in, you can actually extend a shade cloth uh, to block that light. Um, I think there are some other options with, uh, with treatments to the glass or whatever. I can't really remember right offhand um, to actually reduce the amount of light coming through light transmission. Uh, the best way, I think, is just to install a shade curtain. Okay. Okay. And I are, um, is that something I, that is, um, that can be automated as well? If you, if you want to, uh, have the shade at certain parts of the day and maybe in, in some parts of the greenhouse, but not others. Yes. Sure. Yes. That can be automated through the software. Yes. Okay. So yeah, I think that that material that and it's a very low tech type of a, ability to shade in, in a greenhouse. It's a good point, Eric. Is whitewash or the wash that you, you know yeah, that that's happens what often? Of. Yeah. So for for the, for those who don't you know say I I don't want to spend the money on a whole shade system. I'll just in the summertime I'll I'll put a a, a coating on my glazing material. You know that takes care of my season for for the for the high light levels, um, and then you have the the shade itself that that blocks a bit of the light. But one other thing I wanted to, to mention is, is, is really when we're talking about curtains in general, there's, I look at it as three separate sort of types of curtains. I, I look at shade curtain, that is the way Eric described, is, is, is sort of, it, it is reducing the light load in the greenhouse. 
and then we get into uh, a thermal curtain. And oftentimes shade and thermal are used in the same way, but a thermal curtain is intended to keep the heat in at night. It's really, in, in, but a lot of times these shade and thermal curtains are used in the same way. The, it's during the day, it's a shade. At night, it's a thermal curtain. It, it actually traps the energy in. And it's only using a thermal type of uh, uh, automatic operation in the winter time when the outdoor temperature say is, is uh, below a certain point. Um, then the third type of curtain is light, light deprivation is one term. I always refer to as blackout, but really this curtain blocks light. It's, and it's really more for photo period control. So you're gonna have it you know, open up in the morning, you get your X many hours you want for your full day and then it closes at night. So for certain crops that, that require a fixed light a photo period, you would use blackout. And I've seen uh, facilities where you literally have two, possibly three separate sh of these curtains installed in the same uh, compartment. So you can imagine that it's, it, uh, it gets rather busy uh, up there in terms of equipment. Okay, okay. Um, so there was a, a question that came in regarding um, um, DLI, and this might be something we want to cover later, um, later in the, uh, the webinar, um, something we could do it, we could do it now, or we could do it later. Just, uh, should we focus on that now or, or move on? Well, it's, it's, we can tackle it now. It's, uh, it's okay. definitely a big topic, but is there a specific part of that question or? Yeah, the question was, uh, is it common for greenhouses to have, uh, and this is in quotes, roof washers? to ensure accurate readings for DLI? Is this, uh, is this something that um, is, is uh, common that you guys are, are aware of in, in the greenhouse industry? So roof washers would be keeping the, the glazing material clean to get okay. maximum light transmission. That's, I think if I'm understanding that question right, because uh, there is uh, automated roof washers uh, I'd say automated meaning. I think they're they're manually initiated to clean the roof. Um, I think, and they could you know there's a there's a follow up question you can come up. Uh, it, it, I think their question is 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 you know should they ensure that they have a clean roof uh, as they do in the DLI? I would say yes, definitely. But I may have misunderstood the question. Okay, so having a clean roof then does it can make a difference then, and it, it will improve the uh, um, way that that glazing performs then. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, sensors. So, um, what are some of the different types uh, involved there, and and um, how how are they used, and which way uh, how can they um, improve the measurements that you can uh, we can receive. So there's there's a few different types uh, in, in the Argus system. You have what we call a pyranometer. That is a, the global light energy. It, it's it's measurement of units is watts per meter squared. So we use that light uh, weather station light sensor for all climate control. We do use it for shade for for uh, controlling the shade system, uh, and and traditionally we've used it quite a bit in, for our lighting as well. Uh, so that is a sort of a global light energy coming in. Uh, now, uh, more often we're using outdoor PAR sensors. So that's more the PAR range between, uh, you know, between four to 700 nanometers. So uh, that is, is used for the same purpose for lights. We don't often use it for shades, uh, but we primarily as well use it for controlling lights for DLI control. So. Uh, so we have your pyranometer, that's your outdoor light energy, watts per meter squared. We have our PAR, which is uh, your micromole reading that we use to accumulate for your moles. But we have to talk about the type of, uh, of PAR sensors as well, because there's a, there's a few types that they, they provide. Um, one important one is if you have a PAR sensor, make sure you understand what it's rated for in terms of a light source, because they do have different models for different light sources. So the, the basic one is calibrated for outdoor light. It's calibrated for sun. So that's intended to be outside. It can be in the, in the greenhouse environment, but if it is, you have to know what type, of, what type of artificial light source that you have. So if you have one, 
we have to go and check the manufacturer and find out what is the accuracy for that type of light source. So you have your HID or your, your LED, the various type of light sources that will impact accuracy. Or you can purchase a power light sensor that's calibrated for those electronic sources. So that's gonna be the best bet is, is make sure that we get your light sensor in the compartment uh, uh, basically selected for that artificial light source. And it will also be accurate for the outdoor light, uh, the, the light from the sun. The other uh, big consideration in the indoor environment is typically your light sensors are a single cell. And, and a lot of times your outdoor are a single light sensor. But all the light manufacturers have multi-cell, they call it like a bar. So they'll have a bar that's like, you know, a few feet uh, long and they'll have three light sensors on that, on that light sensor. So the idea with that is you can, you put it in your compartment. If you have any shadowing that's going to go on in your, in your, from a beam or other parts of your structure, the three sensors will be able to average those, uh, that out. So we'll be able to, if there's, if one light sensor is shadowed, then the other two will pick it up. So important bits here, one, make sure that that sensor is, is uh, both, uh, if it's for PAR use, uh, as well as the type of uh, a source, and decide if you wanna go with a, a bar type sensors as multiple sensors. Typically it's three, I think I've seen them five and seven uh, in terms of the type number of sensors. Uh, I know Lycor and both Apogee and Lycor have both of those types of sensors. Okay. Um, Eric, do you have uh, some, anything to add on the types of sensors that might be um, best used for different applications uh, in indoor uh, uh, greenhouses? Uh, I'd, actually, I think Jeff covered it very well. <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Um, are there other <laughs> types of equipment um, that that maybe you wouldn't think of as so frequently when you're thinking about things that might affect lighting in your greenhouse that can affect lighting in the greenhouse. Um, yeah, well, you know, yeah, any overhead equipment, of course, can block the light from uh, nat the natural sunlight coming in. Um, as uh, examples would be like unit heaters. Uh, there are greenhouses that have uh, unit heaters that hang in the ceiling. Uh, they can block it, light from coming in. Um, any any overhead equipment will have an effect on the light coming in. Um, also, we should consider yeah. the 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 material in the greenhouse itself. You can often see that in in in. Uh, and you know, why are things white in a greenhouse, right? So we want to make sure that everything that that light hits is going to reflect back into crop, right? Uh -huh. So so we don't want to have everything uh, that's going to absorb it. So you know, that's why you have white, uh, you know, on on the bottom there. You'll have white on the sides. Anything that reflects that light into the crop. And the other part is the crop itself, and the location of that sensor. Consider that you know, corn. You know, corn, or that's usually for research, but there's some crops that grow quite tall. So if you have your sensor buried in that crop and it's controlling lights above it, then it may be turning on a lot of that light above it, but not really seeing it down below. So we have to make sure the location of our sensors is that's not shadowed by, by the crops themselves. So uh, as well as the, the, the crops themselves are going to block light on other parts of the the greenhouse so something to consider oh yeah i never would have considered plant material as uh, being something that could affect lighting that's very interesting uh, okay that um um one uh, let's see here uh question that, that came in was also mentioning about how light fixtures uh, uh could be cleaned periodically to maintain their eff efficacy um, and some lights may not be created to be cleaned that well. So that's an, uh, an interesting point as well. Okay. Um, uh, that would be probably more of an, Eric, what sort of maintenance have you done on lights? 
Um, typically, it would be like quarterly. We would pull the light lenses out, just clean them off, or maybe semi-annually. Um, just keep them clean. Um, replace some fixtures as they, you know, if the if the glass become too dirty, we just replace it. We kept replacement lenses around for that purpose. Um, but it was literally just taking them down and cleaning them with some window cleaner and paper towels. And we just try to keep everything as clean as we could to ensure we were getting the maximum amount of light from our lights that we could. We also uh, would periodically do a wholesale change out of the lighting because those the metal halide and sodium vapor bulbs uh, after a certain amount of time they start losing their intensity and we would try to maintain the same intensity throughout the year so we would develop a just a regular change out schedule where we just change out all the bulbs at one time whether they were uh, working or, or not you know if, even if they were still working we just replace them to keep that light intensity level up. Okay, makes sense. So one, one additional comment to that is, is uh, using the software, we can, using the Argus program, track how long the lights have been on for. So we can do that, you know, the number, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours, and you may have a time, you know, at, at 10,000 hours, your, your, uh, your lights are going to start to degrade. So you might decide that's going to be your replacement schedule. So what Eric talked about is more of a routine replacement at, you know, three, six, nine months, or you may decide to use a control system to tell you I'm at replacement X for that row, you know, then you, that gives you alert time to replace your lamps. So there is the fixed maintenance or let the system tell you when to replace it. And, and in addition, um, in addition to the replacement and cleaning, um, the um, cleaning of the sensors themselves. So you're going to clean yes. the bulbs, clean the, the, the various parts of the lamp, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you, you know, the sensors that are in the compartment. Now, you may have to get yourself a lift and clean that sensor on the roof too. So, so keep in mind that your outdoor, uh, outdoor light sensor will have to be cleaned. Um, and keep in mind that, you know, birds land on outdoor light sensors and, and get them dirty. So we have to, you know, that, that can happen. And that, and that may bring up another point of maybe you want two sensors just in case, you know, one that sort of is when you use for your control and one you use as a sort of a, a check or a backup. Okay. Uh, question came in uh, regarding um, what we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, about light reflecting toward the plant sometimes. Uh, does the use of reflecting sheets on the wall of the greenhouse increase the light intensity uh, by reflecting light toward the plants uh, in the case of supplemental light usage? I would say yes. I'd say if you walk into an environment that has a lot of reflective material, you're going to want your glasses on for sure, <laughs> your sunglasses on. So, I, I, but Eric, did from your background, what would you say on reflective? Uh, I don't know if it necessarily increases the intensity, but it will. I think it will. Uh, reflect light more toward the bottom of the plant. So if, if the walls have the reflective light on them, uh, where usually your plants are like in a row or whatever, it, it may get actually shading from the row beside it, you know, and it, you're actually reflecting that light all around the plant when it's the, that kind of material on the walls and everything. Or well, that's what I would think. Okay. Okay. Uh, there was uh, another question here that, that came in before we get into the next uh, section of the webinar that I think might fit here. Um, talking about the, uh, the uh, PAR lights, this was something that was, uh, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, um, there were two questions regarding PAR lights. One was, uh, uh, could you please give some examples of PAR lights and what colors they produce? Uh, maybe let's hit that one first, if you guys could. 
in terms of the you're talking about light a light source from what i can oh, understand okay mm -hmm. i believe so uh the other question was asking about if argus omni sensors are uh are capable of uh, reading led par The, the Argus uh, Omni uh, light sensors are really intended for a light detection. Uh, they do uh, display a PAR reading, uh, but they're, they're in, and they're, they are calibratable to PAR, but they're not calibrated to an LED light source. So any, anytime you get into uh, uh, wanting to know, you know, the correct, you know, accurate PAR readings for any artificial uh, source, I recommend a, um, like an, uh, anything like an Apogee or Lycor that's, that is intended for that purpose. Okay. Okay. And that uh, question about the PAR lights was, was uh, regarding light sources, it looked like. So you're going to have, um, you know, the, 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 the combination of red, blue, uh, you know, the various light sources. Uh, that is probably a question that's outside of my sort of knowledge base in terms of the type of lamps. Um, uh, uh, and, there, and that's usually around the the LED uh, sort of light sources, as opposed to the um, high pressure sodium or the metal halide. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, let's uh, continue then with the next uh, topic we had planned to discuss, which I believe is the role and the importance of automation in controlling light in the greenhouse. So. Um, uh, Eric, did you want to get us started with some of the, um, um, the, the ways that automation can control light in the greenhouse? Sure. Um, we, uh, through the Argus system, we could control, you can control the photo period. You can have a set photo period of X number of hours and you bring the lights on at a certain time, cut them off at a certain time. And uh, I just saw a message about internet issue, but um, or you can control them based off light levels, light intensity. You know, if your outdoor light level is above a certain point, and say, "Hey, I'm getting enough natural sunlight. I don't need the lights on." We can shut them off and monitor that light level, bring the lights back on whenever the outside light levels drop down too low. Um, but we can control by photo period. Uh, light intensity, uh, other conditions, you know, you can have uh, conditions for temperature uh, is too high and in, this, in the compartment and you want to kill the lights to reduce threat to the crop, you know, they're just, we can control a bunch of different things like that. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Jeff, what, what would you say is, uh, is the role really uh, of, of automation and, and as far as uh, controlling light in the greenhouse? Really, it's, it's to provide consistency, uh, you know, with your crop. Uh, there's consistency. There is, uh, you know, required photo periods uh, for, for crops. So it enables a, a grower to gr uh, grow outside their, their regular season. Um, uh, there, you know, in terms of automating, uh, as Eric brought up, you can you could do some emergency type of control, like it's too hot in the environment. I can't bring my lights on. Let's let's turn them off. In in certain cases with shades, I might say, okay, if I have a uh, a failure of my cooling system, uh, you know, either being a pad or some other pad and pan system, I'm going to pull my shade over, even though I need that light. I need to have the shade covered to uh, to protect my crop and, and lower that temperature, that solar load in that environment. So, so it's it's you know one we're providing treatment. We need to provide our crop the right amount of light at the right time throughout the day, and we can automate that by feedback off that that sensor um, as well as that time of day. Or we talk about DLI, then it's more of a you know, an algorithm for predictability of your day. But when we talk about your standard shade, your blackout, your lights, it's generally a feedback and as well as time of day. 
as well as all those overrides we talked about, high temperature, uh, equipment failure. This is a backup cooling sort of uh, uh, strategy. So the whole idea with all this, this automating the system is one, light treatment as well as protecting the crops. And then another part that we, we haven't even touched in is alarms. You know, what happens when things go wrong? And that's critical. So something that a, a system without control doesn't provide you is the ability to tell you, one, you know, what if my lights got accidentally turned on in the middle of the night in, in, or outside your photo period? You know, what do we do? We, okay, now I've been alerted. Now I can go and correct it. So, and because, you know, light, light being applied to a crop outside of its photo period can have disastrous results, especially if you don't see it, if it goes on for days. So it could be thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in damage to a crop that, that it, just because of a light turned on. So, so in those uh, instances, um, when an alarm might have changed that, uh, that situation with your lighting, um, how, what, what can you walk me through what it might look like for a, a grower or someone who's a, this technician who is in charge of that system at a greenhouse? Yeah, so we would, we would set up an alarm, uh, a couple different types. One would be alarm that is off your light sensor. So we, we're detecting, um, let's talk about at night. So light turns on for whatever reason, contact are stuck on, lights are on. So we're detecting light and we know we turned off your lights. So we, our program says, okay, we've turned off your lights, but we're seeing light. We're seeing light above a certain point that's dangerous to the crop. So then the system will then call out or email out. The technician would receive that alert. They would connect into the system. They would see that, oh, is it just simply manually turned on? Or is the program calling for, well, we have to take a look at the logic. Or do we have to hop on a truck and go to the site and see, okay, is there something else been, that's been uh, on, either in the panel or a breaker or contactor stuck on? So there's all, all sorts of things that could be causing the problem, but the key is, is the manager of that system is alerted that there is a problem. The opposite of that, during the day, say the, you know, or during just as you go into photo period, lights aren't turning on is, is, is on the right time. So that would be um, lights not turn on on time. Same sort of thing. We, we, we have a light sensor looking at uh, you know, the conditions for light, but also we know that we're trying to turn the lights on. And then we trigger a separate uh, alert to the grower and say lights are not, uh, not on, low light levels. So then again, the, the, the user would then connect into the system remotely and determine what is the, the case? Is it, we, we've actually turned the lights on, but we're not seeing the right reading. Could it be simply a problem with the light sensor itself, which is possibility, but then either way, you're gonna to need to go to site and physically take a look at it. Okay, very good, very good. So um, we, we mentioned a little bit about um, the impact of temperature. Um, so what are some ways that, uh, that shading um, and some of the other um, systems that can be put in place in, in the greenhouse can handle some of those elements that can have a big effect on crop like temperature. It's, it's a bit tricky with shading systems, but uh, controlling based on temperature, uh, at least of what I've seen, because the, the shading systems have a, they have a relatively huge effect on the temperature in the environment. So we, we, we typically try to control our shade systems using outdoor light. Uh, and then we allow the, uh, uh, the indoor you know, mechanical or venting systems to take care of the, the, the temperature control. Now, there's no reason why we can't put logic into the shade, but the idea is when we do it, we do it with a case that it, it covers the environment and then we may even trigger an alarm saying, oh, by the way, we've just initiated your shade to lower temperature. You may well take a look at your mechanical equipment. So, so it's, that's why it's always good as a, a sort of a safety backup and as well as an alert to tell you that they've done it. Because you might say, well, why is my shade covering? I want maximum light on my crop. So I know I've seen shade systems. I've seen ones that are uh, coming out of Europe. They're a little bit more 
um, the, the way they're designed. Uh, so there is some new ones coming out in the market where we can do more of a proportional type control because most cases with shades, you rather you're deploying them usually in uh, increments of, you know, 10, 20, 30% over, right? Never, never a few percentage point at a, open at a time. Um, for the main reason is we don't want, you know, one, it doesn't impact the light uh, as much in the environment, but two, we don't want to overuse this equipment. We want to be conscientious that we don't want to open and close this equipment frequently throughout the day and, you know, have a mate, creating a maintenance problem with the equipment. Um, regarding uh, particular crops, um, some there's some that might have seasonal light requirements. Um, are there ways that automation can help uh, with regard to artificial lighting in the growth stages that are uh, for a particular crop? I think that's primarily around um, uh, you know, the photo period we talked about for a particular crop. Uh, there's another uh, strategy that's used in, in our program. We call it cyclical lighting. Uh, it, what it means is essentially we're turning the lights on and off frequently. So, uh, and for certain plants uh, that uh, they, they do not know when the light's been turned off. So the, you turn them on uh, infrequently like say every 10 minutes on and off or every half an hour or whatever that time period is for that crop. And the plants don't know the light's been turned off. So it's a way of saving energy. So that traditionally has been done with incandescent lights, just enough to give plants to know there's light there because we can turn those lights on and off frequently without damaging them. But we can't do that with HID. They need to cool down before we turn them back on. So we can't be doing that all day. But LEDs, we can. They're a little bit more, uh, they can be turned on frequently. So it's, it is an opportunity for, for saving energy is simply turning the lights on and off when we want them on in, in, in an interval. And, uh, and, and, then, and then, but again, it depends on, as very crop specific. I don't know the specific crops. I know I've talked to customers about, clients about uh, using uh, a cyclical light approach. Um, uh, for the idea of saving energy. Okay. Uh, here's, here's a question that came in uh, regarding some of the stuff we talked about a little earlier as well. Can values or parameters be changed on your controller from offsite or are they only able to be uh, monitored from offsite? Yeah, we have full control offsite. So you, if you have a connection to your facility through our client connection or, or some sort of remote inter system, yes, you can make changes. Okay. Um, there was another question from um, regarding sensors. This, so we have to go back a little ways there. Uh, regarding how does Argus integrate um, BACnet or Modbus protocol? for use of sensors such as Apogee or other, I guess, third-party sensors? Yeah, Argus has a, a Modbus uh, capability as well as BACnet. Um, so yes, if, if, if the sensor has uh, that capability of communication, Modbus, BACnet, Argus can communicate with it. So, so if, if it's something that uh, they're looking for, and there's, if there's any doubt, we can get a sensor into our, into our facility. We can test it, you know, verify everything for them if, if they're looking for a specific type of sensor. But, but Argus is capable of communicating through those protocols. Okay. Very good. Um, can we go over some of the, uh, the lighting specific programs? I know that DLI is one that's been mentioned in a few of the questions that we've got here as well. So. Um, can, uh, can we go over a little bit about um, how that particular DLI uh, equation is dialed in for optimal performance of lighting? I'd say, um, I know Eric has done a lot of work on the DLI uh, program in terms of tuning. Um, I've, I've worked with a lot of uh, sites for DLI. I think 
I think the big thing DLI is, you know, short for daily light integral. It's, it's the, it's the management of, of your lighting to maintain a, a specific mole set point per day. Um, so we are using a program that, that when we enter your location in it, it we know uh, based on a table that's uh, sort of embedded into our software, what is the, the maximum amount of mold we can get from your environment each, each day or that particular uh, time of the year. So, and then we use this information almost like a, a prediction. This is what we can do today in terms of our, our, uh, our uh, achievable moles. And then we know uh, we enter in the light source uh, in terms of the intensity. And we know how much light comes into your environment in terms of the, what's being blocked by the glazing material, by the structure. And so we, we bring all this information in and we start to predict. We say, okay, what type of day do we have today? Is it sunny or cloudy? We, we go through our day making these sort of decisions of turning on the lights. So the idea here is we're trying to achieve a, a mole. We have a program that, that predicts your, your uh, amount of moles you're gonna get from other sources being uh, outdoor, artificial. And from that, we are turning your equipment, uh, your lighting, um, uh, on and off throughout the day to maintain that. Okay. Um, Eric, did you want to uh, add some thoughts on the uh, the DLI programming and how that how that uh, particular uh, um, type of uh, program can can impact a, a greenhouse? Well, uh, when that program is really dialed in. One of the things that I've seen is that you actually reduce the on time for your lamps. So you can actually have an energy savings uh, by reducing the time that the lights are on. That also reduces some of the heat load on your cooling equipment. So you, you can actually see a decrease in, uh, oops, excuse me, De uh, decrease in energy cost because you've reduced the heat load in, in that space. And, it, and your cooling system doesn't have to work as hard to keep the temperature maintained. Um, a couple of the biggest uh, positives from it. it one is that we, we can reduce energy consumption and uh, save the client some money. Ain't that something that I think they'd be very interested in? Yeah, it's it's yes. the, pro, the the program actually has sort of two sort of has a switch in the program. One is save save energy. Two is maintain DLI targets. So so there's really two kind of roads you can go down with DLI. The the you know the Eric was talking about saving energy uh, on DLI and and a byproduct of saving your on time of your lamps is energy from, you know, the cooling. But the other side is I want to, if I'm a researcher or, or uh, I want to maintain a, a set mole rate from winter to summer, I want that consistency. So that's, that's the other side of it. So you may, not, you're not going to spend more money on energy. You might still save, but the programs and basically wants to drive it to a, a mole target. So, um, one important note with any sort of DLI control is, is really understanding what is it that your target that you want? Do you want, uh, you know, do you want 20 moles, 25, 30? What, what is the mole target you're looking for? As well as when you're selecting your lights, we got to make sure that they can produce uh, enough supplemental to maintain those mole targets. Because we don't want to have a, a lighting system that you've invested a lot of money into that could produce say five moles a day, 10 moles a day. Well, you have to keep in mind that you may not be able to maintain 30 moles in the winter time because your, your, your outdoor light and your artificial light will not produce it. So it's a very, it's whenever you're starting to think about DLI, you gotta think about, you know, what is it I'm trying to achieve? Am I trying to just achieve that in a time of the year or if it's 12 months of the year and, and what are my light sources giving me? Okay. Uh, that um, leads nicely into uh, this other question that we received here. Um, uh, if the lamp control software is targeting a particular DLI while measuring natural light, 
how does software anticipate the remaining natural light within the given photo period, like uh, before sunset, and then adjust supplemental light accordingly prior to the end of the photo period? So it, it uh, by entering in your location, uh, it knows, and we, we have a table built in, so it knows how much uh, expected light is for the balance of that day. So that would be a, obviously a clear day. So the program will be looking at uh, your current light levels to see if it's going below what is being expected, and it'll make some decisions on turning your artificial light source on to hit that mole target towards the end of the day. Okay, very good. Um, there's another question, a DLI question regarding this as well. So um, it does the DLI program read and take into account light readings from the sensors? And if so, how often are those readings being utilized by the algorithm? On a continuous basis, uh, the primary would be um, the outdoor PAR sensor. Uh, we can use the indoor PAR, but really in terms of the how often the, the Argus system is, is reading those every second um, and accumulating those moles. Excellent. Okay. Um, you talk about moles a bit here, and I was uh, wondering, this was a question that came in earlier as well. Uh, can you explain the differences in uses of the various light units? Uh, they wrote lux, micromoles, foot candles, etc. cetera. The, uh, the PAR range is, is, the, is the, the range that the, the four to 700 nanometers is the plants that uh, the light that the plants see, right? So that's the four to 700 nanometers. The, the two that I'm familiar with, and, and I really don't really talk about is, is really the pyranometer which is the outdoor light sensor in watts meter squared, and that is a much wider light spectrum. So, it's from from uh, you know 100 to 1100 roughly nanometers. So that's that's the spectrum that we're working with. Uh, and then so we have the outdoor, and then we have the indoor. So we we get into some of these other light ranges. Uh, uh, foot candles was a one that was used um, you know a few decades ago. A lot of growers used them because that's all they had, right? Because you know camera shop sold them right so but that that's visible light so and that wasn't always a challenge when 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 you know clients would say oh i i have a pyranometer but i want to read it in in, in micromoles but the challenge there is is yes we could do some sort of rough conversion but because there are two different spectrums it's never going to be truly accurate so i think you know in terms of the um, the light source, um, there's definitely the different spectrums that we're looking at. Um, but generally the two units that Argus works with is, is a watts per meter squared, pyranometer, and then the micromole. Okay, gotcha. Um, were there some other types of uh, additional logic in the, uh, the Argus control systems that we haven't covered yet? Things maybe that um, um, can be uh, part of coordination with other systems? I think one that we haven't touched on yet is a, we call the spray program. So that is a, uh, a program uh, that's really intended for human safety. So whenever you're applying a, a chemical uh, application in your environment, uh, we want to, and you have various phases of that spraying so you're going to, you know, you're going to say, I'm going to go into an environment and I'm going to you know, spray whatever chemical I have in that environment, but I need equipment turned off or closed or, or whatever we need to do at that particular phase. Uh, so we have before we go in that environment, as we're spraying, after we spray, and then at some point we want to purge that compartment so people can go into the compartment with, safely. So Part of the spray program is going to connect into your ventilation equipment, your heating equipment, your light as well. So, because we may not want your lights to be on when you're spraying, and we may want to keep them off until the whole process is completed, or we may decide to turn them on after the spraying is completed. And then, uh, yeah, so that would be one example where we're going to turn off lights and possibly deploy shades during a spray cycle. 
Okay. Excellent. Very good. Um, there was a, another question that came in here. If anyone has any more questions, feel free to get them in. We are uh, running, uh, running close to our hour of allotted time here. So uh, here was the question. Does Argus have any automation in retractable roof greenhouse types? Yes, uh, we've controlled the various manufacturers. Um, open, group, open roof greenhouses, um, really their, their intent is to open the whole environment up. And that's where you get the maximum outdoor. You, normally you wouldn't have an artificial light source in an open roof greenhouse. But, um, but generally the idea with, with the, uh, an open roof greenhouse is we're going to open that environment base to, to take advantage of, uh, again, we talked about the light uh, equipment and the structure that block the light from getting to the crop. Well, when we open up the whole uh, open roof greenhouse, then there's nothing blocking it. So we got, so when we talk about control of an open roof, we're looking at outdoor conditions. Uh, you know, is the outdoor temperature greater than a certain amount? Is the outdoor light greater than a certain amount? And then we open up that environment. So really, I look at an open roof greenhouse as being sort of two, two sort of modes. One, it's a, a roof vent. So we may open it just, you know, a small amount for, for cooling. And there might be other equipment like exhaust fans and that sort for keeping that environment cool. And then we get into a open roof. Now that may be a uh, early in the season, uh, you know, for um, hardening off the crop. Uh, you want to harden off in the, in the early in the, in the spring. And so we're going to be using uh, outdoor conditions to control that environment. Outdoor light is, is going to be a big component. Okay, I have a. I like this question. This is this is one that I'd I'd like both of you to weigh in on. Um, yeah, maybe Eric, if you want to go first, uh, what are you most excited about for the future of greenhouse lighting technology? Uh, me, what I would really like to see, uh, and I'd I'd love to see how it plays out with the DLI programming, but to actually be able to have. ability for your uh, greenhouse uh, to be able to mimic um, sunrise, sunset, um, and if you want it to maintain a certain light set point throughout the day, to be able to uh, say you're only getting 300 micromoles of natural sunlight coming in, but you want to maintain 600. And to have the capability to bring your artificial lights on just enough to maintain that 600 throughout the entire day. I would love to see that. That's, that's what I'm actually hoping to be able to see before too much longer. Great. Okay. Um, and um, how about your thoughts on that then, uh, Jeff? I think... Um... I think that I would say that the holy grail would be the ability to dial in a light spectrum for the crop mm. for its particular phase of the, of its of its cycle. So I know there's there's, there's manufacturers that are already have that and, and they're deployed typically in in, in chamber environments. But uh, you would you know if we want to simulate you know what if we could try to simulate fall? But it'd be difficult in the greenhouse because you do have the sun giving you a different light. Uh, in the spring that doesn't fall, but maybe our light source can help us with that, right? So, so the ability to to dial in uh, uh, you know various light spectrums that you would uh, that you would not get in one time of the year or another, um, and back to what Eric's saying is just really trying to simulate that sun, trying to simulate that that natural light source, and and being able to do it on a uh, rather than a on off or dimming but do it on more. Now I can look at my various breakdown, my par to, to, to actually get various bands of that par between seven, four to 700 nanometers to, to actually give them treatments at particular times. Excellent. All right. Well, we've uh, managed to, uh, to fill up our hour. Um, 
I wanted to uh, make sure that we, we um, thank all of our attendees for taking the time to join today. Uh, and as well, I'd like to uh, uh, remind you that this webinar was recorded and will be uploaded to our website, greenhousemag.com in about a week. And I want to thank our sponsor, Argus Controls as well, and our excellent speakers, Jeff Neff and Eric Cheek. Thank you guys for uh, being here and providing all of this, this great information for the attendees today. Thank you, man. Yeah, thank you. All right, and take care, everyone. Great, thank you.